in the women's strawweight division at UFC 289. This is your opening fight, first fight of the night, fight 11. Diana Belbita, 14 and 7. Maria Oliveira, the Brazilian, 13 and 6. Belbita is one inch taller at 5, 7. Maria Oliveira has a one inch reach advantage at the same time. Now, uh, Belbita, both fighters active, 6.4 significant strikes per minute. Maria Oliveira, 5.3. So it's still a difference of one or 15 over the course of the fight, but both are very active. Neither one lands a takedown on average over the course of three rounds. In fact, they probably land one every five rounds. So highly likely it'll be no takedowns in this fight. Now, Belbita, one and three in the UFC, losing to Gloria DePaula, good fighter, Liana Jojua, Molly McCann. So three good fighters she lost to beat Hannah Goldie by decision. Now, Maria Oliveira. 47% takedown defense, 1-3 in, in the UFC, lost to Demopolis, Ricci, and Marina Rodriguez, pretty good fighter. She beat Gloria DePaula. That's interesting. And Belbita. Okay, so Belbita lost to DePaula by decision. Basically, they were even, though. Maria Oliveira beat DePaula by split decision and pretty much was even there. Wow. I mean, 105-96 to 96 in significant strikes, 2-2 two two in takedowns. And Belbita uh, was 88-87, gave up one takedown. So it's going to be an interesting fight. I think it's going to be a stand-up striking affair. It's going to be a really good first fight. Action-packed, two evenly matched fighters. Uh, and I'm going to lean with Diana Belbita in this one. And it's close to me. I mean, it's really close. She's actually the underdog, barely. But I think Diana Belbita will get the job done here in the third round. It's going to come down to the final two minutes if she gets it done in significant strikes. But really, by winning the third round and move to 15-7, and seven, she'll outpace Maria Oliveira here in the women's strawweight division, UFC 289. In the flyweight division at UFC 289, you got David Dvorak coming at 20-5, and five, taking on Steven Ursig, making his UFC debut 9-1. and one. Guy can land submissions. He's four inches taller than Dvorak at 5'9". He's got a one-inch reach advantage. Both guys, guys stand right-handed. Now, Dvorak, 3.5 significant strikes per minute. Not really, or normally, uh, a threat to land takedowns. And he may want to stay off the ground here against uh, Astro Boy Steve Ursek. Again, making his debut, but can land submissions. Now, Dvorak defends a takedown 81% of the time. That's that's going to help. He went to decisions and loss against Manel Cape and uh, Matthias Nikolaou. So that's saying a lot. Before that, he won three in a row against Ronderos, Espinosa, and Bruno Silva. So... The guy can win and lost two fights uh, by decision against good fighters. Now, here's the deal. Steven Urseg, no disrespect, uh, has fought for eternal MMA. This is going to be a whole different landscape. You're taking on a guy with 25 professional fights who's won three solid UFC fights and lost to two uh, really good fighters in the flyweight division. So Dvorak should dominate here. Shouldn't even be close. He should get the win in the first round, in my opinion. Uh, likely by finish to move to 21 and 5. Urseg will fall in his debut attempt to 9 and 2. Credit him for showing up here. Flyweight division, UFC 289. In the featherweight division at UFC 289, you got Kyle Nelson taking on Blake Builder. Now, Nelson, about 10 more fights than Builder. He's 13 and 5. Builder is 8 0 and 1. Nelson, three inches taller at 5 11. Both guys are 32. Nelson's got a two-inch reach advantage as well, and both guys are switch stance fighters. I love when that's the case because it's rare, but it's nice to see both fighters constantly switching their stances and then can go either way. But it's Builder so far. Limited fights, right? Uh, nearly seven significant strikes per minute, nearly three for Kyle Nelson, but Kyle Nelson can land takedowns, like two over the course of an average three-round fight. So that's important. Uh, so far, Builder's got 100% takedown defense, though. But not enough fights to really be important yet. What's important is that Kyle Nelson has lost a lot of fights. He's 1-5 in, in the UFC, losing to Doho Choi, Jay Herbert, Billy Q, Quarantillo, Matt Sales, and Diego Ferreira. His only win is against Marco Polo Reyes by first-round KO. So he's going to be desperate for a win here. Builder 2-0, beating Shane Young by decision, and Alexander Morgan at the Contender Series by uh, submission. So... Ooh, tough fight to predict, man, because you got a guy in Kyle Nelson that came in like 12-0, and 0, right? 
uh, similar to Blake Builder right now and has lost five out of six. It's a rough, rough start. Uh, but what that tells me is he's going to be hungry here. That tells me he's going to be hungry. And we've already gone with some uh, fighters on the card that are underdogs. And why not go with Kyle Nelson here, right? I mean, one in five, probably a lot of people are going to be uh, th- going against him, thinking he's going to lose. And Blake Bill is a pretty darn good fighter. I won't be surprised if he wins at all. But I like the experience. And, you know, they're both 32, so the age shouldn't be a factor. But it is a factor for Kyle Nelson because – he started out 12-0. and 0. He struggled a little bit, but he's desperate now. He's got to win this fight. If not, he's probably going to be out of the UFC. So look for a desperate fighter in Nelson, and he'll get the job done that way to move to 14-5. and five. Forget the numbers. I mean, forget the numbers. Uh, it's all about desperation mode for Nelson, and when guys are in desperation mode and you're facing a guy like Blake Builder who's really, who, who could be really good, but he's not quite there yet, I got to go with Kyle Nelson despite him being 1-5. He wins, in my opinion, to be 14-5, and five, featherweight division, UFC 289. In the bantamweight division, a UFC 289, Gaiman Zahabi taking on Aori Kalang. Now, Zahabi 9-2, and two, Aori 20-9. and nine. So, he's got, this is his 30th professional fight. Forget about it. Zahabi, one inch, is tall, uh, one inch taller at 5'8". He's about six years old, six years older than uh, Aori. He's 35 the reach advantage goes to Aori by 1, 69, 68. No big deal there. They're both right-handed. Now, Aori doubles up uh, Zahabi on significant strikes. That's going to be a problem. Six per minute compared to three per minute. And uh, lands a takedown every other round where there's almost none for Zahabi, right? So first question is how many fights does, uh, does Zahabi have? He's got five in the UFC. He's 3-2, and two, lost to Vince Morales and Ricardo Ramos, but beat Ricky Tercios, uh, Draco Rodriguez, and Reginaldo Vieira. So uh, he's 3-2 and two in the UFC. I mean, he's not doing bad. Aori, pretty good fighter, come off the back-to-back wins against Jay Perrin. By decision, he also KO'd Cameron L. So both guys kind of doing what they're supposed to do. But the two losses there for Zahabi uh, are tricky and hard for me to get past. When Aori lost to Cody Durden and Jeff Molina, I mean, it, it's very close. I can see why the odds in this one are basically even, uh, but I'm going to lean towards Aori because of the stats, and both fighters got enough fights uh, to where the stats are meaningful here. They, they both got about at least five fights, so, you know, Aori's going to outpace them and may even land some takedowns, but if I'm Aori, I'm just keeping it on the feet, uh, outpacing them two to one and winning that way, maybe even get the finish. Bayori wins, 30th professional fight here. He's going to be 21 and 9, Bantamweight division, UFC 289. In the women's flyweight division, at UFC 289, you got Miranda Maverick taking on Jasmine Jazuda Vicious. Jazuda Vicious, 8 and 2, Maverick 13 and 4. Now, Jasmine stands four inches taller at 5, 7. She's nine years older, though, but still in the prime of her career. Maverick is the young one. Jasmine has a six, or excuse me, Two-inch reach advantage, 68 to 66. Jasmine, right-handed. Maverick, southpaw, left-handed. Now, Maverick lands nearly 3.7 significant strikes per minute, about three per minute for Jasmine. So that's about a difference of 10 in favor of Maverick throughout uh, the course of uh, 15 minutes if it goes that far. Both fighters land like near a takedown per round, so that's pretty good. But Maverick, 44% takedown defense. Jasmine, 72. So that gives Jasmine a little bit of an edge and an equalizer in terms of takedown defense to equal out, uh, equalize the significant strikes. Now, Maverick, back-to-back wins. Shana Young, decision. She uh, submitted Sabina Mazzo, last loss to Aaron Blanchfield, um, who we know is a pretty uh, darn good fighter. Now, Jasmine beat Gabriela Fernandez by decision, lost to Natalia Silva, and beat Kay Hansen over the course uh, of her last three fights. And I'm going with Miranda Maverick. It's real simple. Now, she... Didn't perform well against Aaron Blanchfield when she lost. Gave up seven takedowns, but still went to a decision against a very good fighter. Then came back and won two in a row. So I like her, despite the takedown defense problem. I think she'll get that together, find a way to win to move to 14 and four, likely on significant strikes. Look for her to pull away in the third round here in the women's flyweight division, UFC 289. In the middleweight division, the UFC 289, you got Nazaruddina Mabov taking on. Chris Curtis, and I peeked at the stats a little bit in this one. Normally, I don't do that, 
And it's going to be a tough prediction. I still don't know which way I'm going to go. A Mayval, five inches taller at 6'3". Uh, he's considerably younger than Curtis. Okay, that's something to take into account. Curtis is uh, has a, a one-inch reach advantage. Both guys stand right-handed. Um, and let's get this out of the way. Neither guy really goes for a lot of takedowns. So it's going to be a stand-up strike and a fair. And Curtis has the advantage, 5.6 significant strikes per minute to 4.3 for uh, a Mayvolve. Now, he's coming off the loss to Sean Strickland, but before that, he beat Yaquim Buckley. He beat Edmund Shabazian. He beat Ian Heinish. So he's 3-1 and one in his last four. Now, action man Chris Curtis coming off the loss to Kelvin Gasolin by unanimous decision, but he fought well. He beat uh, Yaquim Buckley by second round KO. So they both got a win over Buckley. He lost to Jack to Joker Hermanson and beat Rodolfo Vieira. Brendan Allen, Phil Hawes. Whew. Three of those five last five wins have come by KO. Uh, Mavov KO'd Shabazian and Ian Heinish. Gosh, this is a tough prediction. Very tough. But I'm going to lean towards Chris Curtis in this. I, I, everything being so close, he lands more significant strikes per minute, so he's more active. He's... 35, so he's not too old, but the 28 of Mavoff is still on the rise. He's still got some things to learn. And they, we talk about levels to this game all the time, and this is one of them. I like Chris Curtis and the 40-fight experience in this one, despite the fact that he's the underdog. I think Chris Curtis is going to pull this out by KO or by decision. It's going to be a great one, though. A lot of intrigue here. He wins and moves to 31-10, and 10, middleweight division, UFC. 289 in the middleweight division at ufc at 289 the first fight on the main card the pay-per-view card you got mark andre Barial taking on eric anders now Barial 15 and 6 anders 15 and 7 this is going to be a pretty close fight at least on paper both guys stand at 6-1 both guys still relatively in the prime of their career uh anders one inch tall uh, one inch reach advantage excuse me 75 to 74 he's a southpaw Barial. Stands right-handed, and Barry Alt's very active. 5.9 significant strikes per minute to 3.4 for Anders. Uh, but the takedown game favors Eric Anders, where he lands 1.6 over the course of three rounds. Barry Alt uh, barely lands takedowns at all. So the next big question is a takedown defense for Barry Alt. That's 62%. So that opens the door for Eric Anders, who also has a nearly 80% takedown defense, which really doesn't matter because Barry Alt's not trying to go for takedowns. So... You got the speed and quickness and the power of Barry Alt. I mean, don't get me wrong, Eric Anders has power too. But he's looking to get the takedown and the ground and pound game going. So we'll see how this plays out. Now, Barry Alt's coming off a win over Julian Marquez by KO. Before that, he lost to Anthony Hernandez and beat Jordan Wright. That's a pretty big one. Now, Anders, on the other hand, beat Kyle Dawkins by KO. But he lost to Jung Yong Park and Andre Muniz by split decision and... Uh, armbar submission so both guys coming in this fight off a win feeling good uh and it, it is going to be an interesting fight i mean because eric anders is going to shoot for takedowns i mean he's had four in his last two fights that's clearly what he wants to do but it like against jung yong park he gave up 105 significant strikes compared to his 65 so despite the three takedowns it didn't do much for him now against kyle Dawkins, he looked great and got the finish in round two and that's why things are very tricky in this situation. Now, Anders is going to look more cut, more ripped, stronger. And with the weak takedown defense for Burial, he may very well get the job done. But I'm going to lean with Burial in this fight, right? I just think he's going to outstyle Anders and defend the takedowns a little bit better. And if he can stay on his feet, that's the key. He's going to outstrike Anders. And I think he will just like uh, Jung Young Park did. So Mark andre Burial wins, in my opinion, may, mainly, he's going to get taken down, but mainly on significant strikes to move to 16-6, and six, middleweight division, UFC 289. In the featherweight division at UFC 289, you got Dan 50K Ige coming in 16-6, and six, taking on Nate Landwehr. He comes in at 17-4. and four. So two guys with good records, used to winning most of the time. Landwehr, two inches taller at 5'9". They're both at the prime uh, age or prime of their career. Landweir's got about a one-inch reach advantage. No big deal there. They both stand right-handed. Now, they got several UFC fights, so this is where it gets important. Nate Landweir, 6.5 significant strikes per minute, 50K. 
3.8 per minute. So significant advantage there for Landwehr. Takedowns are like the same. They usually land just over a takedown in the course of three rounds. So expect them both to have a takedown in this fight. Defense will be important. 52% for Ige, not very good. 86% for Landwehr. So it's even looking better for him. Now, 50K came uh, or is coming off a win over Damon Jackson. Surprising. Second round KO. He looked good there. Now, listen to who he lost to. Mavsar of Loev. Good fighter. Josh Emmett. Really good fighter. Korean Zombie. A good fighter. He beat Gavin Tucker, Edson Barbosa. That's a big win by split decision. He also lost to Calvin Cater. So he's losing to the big dogs. Got to take that into consideration. Lamweir, three in a row, beating Awesome Lingo. Uh, David Onama. He beat Lingo by submission, Onama by, by majority decision. He also sub Ludovic Klein. Lost to Julian, Juicy J, Arosa, and Herbert Burns. He beat Darren Elkin. So, man, tough prediction. Tough prediction because Ige is going to fight a lot better than the stats uh, would show. And I think I'm going to lean with him to win this fight. I don't go against the stats a lot, but up and down this card, you see guys with lower stats, they find ways to win. And a lot of the losses up and down this card are to good, good fighters. This is why Dan Ige is the favorite in this fight, and I do expect him to win. I peek at the stats or the odds last, and Dan Ige is over a two to one favorite, so that's that makes sense to me. I like Ige to win this fight. I think it's going to go to a decision, but he'll win two out of three rounds, probably land two takedowns, little ground and pound, and keep things close on the feet to move to seventeen and six. In my opinion, featherweight division, UFC, two eighty nine in the welterweight division at UFC two eighty nine. You got Mike Mallett. Taking on Adam Fugit. Now Mallet 9 and 1 coming in. Fugit 9 and 3. So both guys used to winning. They're both 6 1. Of course, they're 170 pounds. Now Fugit's got a 4 inch reach advantage, 77 to 7. He's a southpaw. Mike Mallet stands right handed. So we got opposite stance fighters. Also, so far it is two fights in. Adam Fugit lands about 5.4 significant strikes per minute to 4.5. For Mike Mallett, so he's got an advantage here. He also lands more takedowns, nearly five over the course of three rounds. But that's because he had a lot uh, or several takedowns in his first two fights. Mike Mallett lands about two over the course of three rounds. He's been in more fights to, you know, solidify his stats a little better. Now, Mallett, so far, 0% takedown defense. That's because Mickey Gall took him down once. And Shaman Smotritsky also took him down. He hasn't defended any. Both times uh, his opponent attempted a takedown, they got it. But he's 3-0. and 2-0 uh, in the UFC, 1-0 in Dana White's contender series where he beat Smotritsky by submission. He beat Mickey Gall by KO, and he subbed uh, Johan Linesi. So this guy is used to winning. He's come into the UFC and hasn't struggled at all. Now his opponent, uh, Adam Fugit, 100% takedown defense. He beat Yasaku Kinoshita uh, by quick first round. KO, well, not quick, but he got it in the first round, 436 into the first round. He lost his UFC de debut against a good fighter, Michael Morales, by third round KO. So you can expect this to be a very close fight, <clears throat> but I agree with the odds here. Mike Mallett's like a two to one favorite. I would agree to that. I'm looking things over now, usually I go with the guy with better stats. I mean, Fugit's got better stats and 100% takedown defense, but you also got to remember. We're just two fights in. It'd be different if we were 10 to 12 fights in. Then we'd have to go with Fugit, no doubt about it. But Mike, right now, Mike Mallett is the better fighter. He's coming in with just one loss. He's undefeated in a UFC setting and the contender series. So I like him to win this thing. I'd love to see him get a finish, right? Make it four in a row. If you count the contender series, or three in a row in the UFC. But he's going to land over four significant strikes per minute. He's going to defend the takedowns pretty well. He's going to land some takedowns. He's better all over the place and if he gets a finish it's likely going to come in the second or third round but look for him to win to move to 10 and 1 welterweight division ufc 289 in the lightweight division at ufc 289 your co-main event charles Oliveira, aka olives is back he comes in at 33 and 9 the brazilian takes on the american vanille darius who comes in at 22 and 4 both guys 510 both guys 33 or 34 years of age, so relatively close in age. Oliveira has a two-inch reach advantage, 74 to 72. He's right-handed. Dariush stands uh, southpaw, left-handed. Dariush lands 3.8 significant strikes per minute. Oliveira 
3.5, so very close in that area. Takedown game is very similar with Darius landing about two takedowns over the course of three rounds. Oliveira, 2.4. So that's the stats. They look very even, uh, very close on paper. But where Darius has a big advantage is in takedown defense. 80% for him, 55% for Oliveira. So Oliveira gets taken down, but then he usually holds his own on the ground, except against Islam uh, Mahachev, who beat, who, who beat him by submission. Before that, he'd be Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler, Tony Ferguson, Kevin Lee. He beat all the old heads and beat them all uh, by finish, except Tony Ferguson, who went to a decision. Remember in that fight, he just refused to tap on any submissions. It's crazy. Uh, but Neil Dariush, on the other hand, is coming off a big win over Matush Gamrot. Right? Not surprised by the win, but Matush Gamrot was rising at the time. He came in and beat him. Beat uh, Tony Ferguson by decision not really decisive just had three takedowns and controlled the heck out of him he also beat diego ferreira by split decision we're starting to see how good diego ferreira is he also beat scott holtzman by ko now the tough thing with this is benil de seems to be a guy that can beat anybody on any given night uh but i'm still not convinced that charles Oliveira is done like just because he lost to islam mahachev doesn't mean he's just going to fall off uh the face of the earth, you know, and this fight is basically even. I mean, Darius is a slight favorite uh, because people are questioning Charles Oliveira, and maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I just like Charles Oliveira to win. I think he's got something to prove coming into this fight, right? He's got to win this to get back uh, toward the title direction. You lose this, now you're looking at two or three wins before you can ever get back to the title, and maybe you start to fall off the cliff at that point. And I don't think Oliveira is ready to do that. 33 means he's still in his prime. He still has time. He is the former champ. And it's Darius who's got to come in and beat him, not the other way around. Charles Oliveira's got to defend the takedowns, which he doesn't do very well. But if he does get taken down, Darius is very good at controlling people. Oliveira's going to have to figure it out. But I think he will. I think he will figure this thing out. And at worst, win by uh, decision, in my opinion. He'll outstrike Darius, he'll reverse some positions, and if it goes to a decision, he'll get this thing. But I like him to potentially get a submission victory here uh, to move to 34-9 in the lightweight division. Co-main event, UFC 289. In the women's bantamweight division for the women's bantamweight division title. You got Amanda Nunez, a longtime champion, lost the belt, took the belt back. She comes in at 22-5 and five with the belt this time. Irene Aldana. Comes in at 14 and 6. So a lot of losses there for Irene Aldana. But let's break this thing down. Aldana's one inch taller at 5'9. One thing that will help Nunez in this fight is that Irene Aldana is actually older than her. She's 35. Nunez, 34. Both have a 69 inch reach. Both fight right handed. Now, Aldana is very active, landing 5.4 significant strikes per minute compared to 4.4 for Nunez. But Amanda Nunez can land takedowns. Nearly one per round might be slowing down a little bit in that area, but she can still land the takedowns, and they will be crucial in this fight because Aldana doesn't really land takedowns at all. And to make it even worse for Aldana, Nunez has an 82% takedown defense. Now, as you know, Juliana Pena beat Amanda Nunez by uh, rear naked submission in round two. Nunez came back. And beat her by a decisive decision with six takedowns. For that, she'd be Megan Anderson, Felicia Spencer, Jermaine De Randami. She was beating everybody. That's why I was a shock that she lost to Juliana Pena. Now, Adana has won back to back fights against Yana Santos and Macy Chiesan. That was a big one uh, by KO. So she is getting better. Now, she did lose to Holly Holm by, deci uh, by decision, giving up five takedowns. See, that's, that's the problem. A uh, loss on significant strikes, 154 to 69. So her numbers, you know, are usually well against other fighters, but they didn't stack up when she fought Holly home. And that's kind of how I think this fight's going to go. I mean, she's getting an opportunity here. You never know. But she's not on the level uh, of Amanda Nunes. That's very clear. But Amanda Nunes seems to be slowing down. I don't think she's slowing down enough uh, to lose this fight, though. I think she comes in here and dominates. 
the lioness is back you know now she'll have a tougher fight against pena in the future uh, or if she goes back up to featherweight to defend that belt at some point in time she'll have some tougher fights aldana got this fight on somewhat short notice not too short but wasn't expected now she gets thrown in there so you know should be an easier fight for nunez we'll see but i like her to win i like to see her get the finish here so we'll see but nonetheless in my opinion amanda nunez wins retains the belt moves to 23 and 5 here in the women's band and weight division at ufc 289